evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, Griffith University political scientist Anne Tiernan. The Boris and Brexit-loving head of the Menzies Research Institute, Nick Cater. Tony Blair's legendary spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, who's just released a documentary about his battle with depression. English-born businesswoman, Kate Mills. And former West Australian Premier, Jeff Gallup. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, we've got plenty of great questions in the audience tonight, but our first one is on Skype. It's from Kent Getzinger in Adelaide. Hi, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, panel. Uh, I'd like to ask a question because journalist Vincent Navarro writes that xenophobia and racism are symptoms of populist movements. And the cause of populism is the enormous deterioration of the working class's living conditions. So why do political leaders and pundits distract us by focusing on these symptoms which only divide us? And being a U.S. citizen living abroad, just saying just yesterday, a recent example of this was when President Trump made more racist slurs against four progressive U.S. congresswomen saying that they were incapable of loving their country. Thank you. Alistair Campbell, I'll start with you. Obviously, Trump's uh, comments have resonated around the world. Well, I'm afraid Trump's comments always do. Uh, and I think it's a real problem for the world because America is the most powerful democracy in the world. And whether we've, they've been on the right or the left, we've been used to having at least a certain shared universal respect for the person who holds the, off the, holds the office. And I think, I think in most countries, with the possible exception of Russia, that a majority of people find Donald Trump pretty much despicable. And I think he is a racist. Uh, the worst thing about it is we knew all this before he was elected, and the people still elected him. And that's what populism, to me, is doing to our politics. There's a populist virus in the world at the moment. And I, I did an interview with the, the Guardian newspaper here recently, and there were some great comments. And I don't know who this guy is, but he's called Sleuth for Truth. And he put a comment on the bottom of this piece, and he said, populism is diving headfirst into a swimming pool because you're angry that there's no water in it. <laughs> and think about that. People, Brexit, I'm sure we'll talk about Brexit, the people who have voted for Brexit, particularly working-class people that the, the guy mentioned in his, in his call, they're going to be the ones who are going to have the hardest hit. And somehow, these populist leaders, Trump, Johnson, Farage, they're liars, they, they don't actually stand up for people. They manipulate their own kind of intentions with... with, with the, Trump talks about fake news. He's the biggest crater of fake news on the planet. And that is what's driving this sense of they have captured people who may have legitimate grievances with the way that politics is not working for them, the economy is not working for them, but their solution is to exploit the grievance rather than address the grievance. Just a, just a quick one before we move on, and yes, we will come to Brexit but later, but you've gone a long way down the track in your last GQ article suggesting that Trump's bigotry is akin to fascism. Um, we know that that's one of those things that you just never say without getting well, a backlash. Yeah, you get a backlash, but I didn't say... What I actually said was... If I, had an argument, I don't argue with Jeff's old mate, Tony Blair, that much. We agree on most things. But I did an interview with GQ for GQ with Tony. It was a bit weird interviewing somebody when you kind of know what he thinks about any, any, everything. But anyway, and I said to him, are you not worried that there are just too many parallels in the world today than there were in the 30s? And there are so many. Fake news is one of them. Mm. Anti-Semitism. How has anti-Semitism come back into our politics? And it's come back on the left and the right. Mm. The hatred of the elites. But Blair, the Blair, Blair said you were going over the he top. He thought I was then. going over the top. But has he... Your recent article suggests he may have changed his opinion. Um, well, he's, it's He's reading The Rise and Fall of the Third he Reich, He said say. to me, I saw him last week, and he said, have you read this book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, by William H. Shearer? It was written in 1960. I said, no. He says, I'm reading this book, I can't put it down. I'm now reading this book, I can't put it down. Because on every page, you feel the resonance. So, you know, that thing he did the other day with the, with the Congress, the four congresswomen of colour, Hitler was doing that stuff. And, you know, I'm not saying he's going to go out and kill six million people. I'm saying the seeds of fascism are being sown. And if we're not careful, we end up in a very dark and dangerous place. Nick Cater, um, do you think the seeds are being sown? 
Look, I find that kind of rhetoric really quite troubling. I mean, I would, whenever you write, write a column and you're tempted to go to the 1930s or fascism, you immediately hold back your hand. Look, there, there are many things that disturb us about society nowadays and that there is, there is increasing intolerance to free speech, for example, uh, particularly on the left, I have to say. And, and uh, right across the board, you see people not wanting to shut down... What can you not say? What is the, this thing about free speech? The right wing peddle this thing about free speech. What are you not allowed to but, say? Uh, uh, but you, well, uh, this is a prelude to what I was going on to say. OK, but, let, let but nothing, nothing is the answer. You can say whatever the hell you want. I think, we go back to the question, which I think could, could do with a lot of analysis in itself, there were a number of assumptions in there which, which one wouldn't necessarily agree. But on, the, on this question of populism, it seems to me that so often people condemn their, their opponents as populist because they can't understand or they don't like the fact that they're popular. And, and the, re the real reason, the real reason, I think, that we're seeing a rise of, of, of people like Donald Trump is because conventional politics has let them down. Conventional politics, politicians are, are too wary or won't talk about the things that they're interested in. We've seen that in this country. We, we, had, the, we had Pauline Hanson in, from the 90s until now has been saying things that ordinary people think. And, uh, and politicians Nick, can on I just, both can, sides Nick, haven't I been just, willing uh, to go there. Can I just interrupt for one second? I mean... With all the best will in the world, she's sure. not the President of the United States, the most powerful country in the world. Can you see any justification for President Trump singling out four congresswomen of colour and saying, more or less, you should go back where you came from? When, there, when three of them what, were born and raised what, in America? What you're, seeing, what you're seeing is this sort of battle of outrage. You see Trump is actually getting traction from making these comments. And he gets more traction when people come up and condemn him as racist leadership. or whatever. Not, but my, my, then question, at the same my question time, was, can you see any justification for him saying those things, apart from trying to get some political advantage? Well, it's, it's not something I would have advised him to say if I was Alistair, Alistair Campbell to Tony Blair. I was... Of course not. I mean, and, and, and in, this, in this... Of course you wouldn't uh, uh, advise somebody to say something like that. But the, the but point is... But we, you're we not, are you're talking not disturbed about, by We are talking about uh, we have these, these people who, who are determined to be outraged by whatever Trump said. Trump could stand up there and he could ring his, read his grandmother's shopping bill no, and people no. would be outraged. They get traction out of being outraged. He gets traction by people being outraged against us and the whole thing continues. If his it's mother's shopping bill but said that people of colour should go back to the countries where I, I they will, or their ancestors I will, came from, I will say, you might be right. I will say one thing here, that to compare to Trump to, uh, you know, the 1930s to, I suppose, you're talking about, if you're talking about fascism, Italy or probably more, more cogently yeah. Germany... I, I think he's just way over the top. I think you're wrong. There, we, we have, we I'm not saying very... he's Hitler and I'm not saying he's Stalin. I'm saying that what he's doing, there are but a to, lot of to resonance. To make those comments, to me, belittles and, and uh, what really happened in the 90s. It doesn't. It you, actually, uh, it doesn't. Nick, it really uh, does. Nick and Alistair, we'll come back to both of you and <laughs> we'll move down the panel. And Anne, yeah. Actually, is the best way to pay respect to people who died in a to learn the proper lessons. Sorry, Anne. No, Sorry. No. Well, look, I think you're hitting on the, the democratic discontent and anxiety that's characterising our politics. And like the 1930s, to the extent that it followed a major economic shock in which many people have done very badly. And you're right, Nick, that trust has been lost in institutions and processes and people are entitled to feel left behind. I think populists on the left and right position themselves deliberately as outsiders. They're aggressively nationalist, I think that's why you're disturbed. Um, and they're very often anti-immigrant. Um, and this is, you know, Trump's... Um, particular assault on these uh, four women um, has has had a you know a, a chilling effect I think Nick to be honest on you know attacking people in a country that is actually an immigrant nation mm. um, that always welcomed immigrants and you know three of them were born in in that country so it seems an odd <laughs> remark to have made. Now President Trump makes many odd remarks and this feeds the outsider-ism that he has cultivated. And very often, of course, too, populists trade on emotion, on plain speaking, and that was a bit implicit, I think, to the remark you made about Pauline Hanson, saying the things that people are thinking. But, but whether that's leadership, I think, is, a, is another point. But, you know, no doubt the charismatic leader, as they position themselves, um, you know, uh, adopt this style. I think many of us are concerned about um, the rise of authority 
authoritarianism among some of these populist leaders, and we haven't talked about them in other in other countries. Uh, you know, the Philippines, um, you know, uh, Turkey, lots of other places. But and not I think the United many States. People, You're not suggesting there's um, authoritarianism in the United no, no, States. No, no, no. But the, right. the populism it's is a be. spectrum of you know. There's a there's a deep vein of scholarship about what it is describing mm. it. Um, you know, many I work with many experts who work in this field. What I think people are very good at doing is describing it, analysing why it, why it's happened. Almost no one can tell us what to do about it. Mm. And I think that's okay. the that's the primary. Let's move across to the side of the panel. And um, so, what do you think? Um, you're British by nature, by, by birth, birth, I should say, <laughs> not by nature. Australian, Australian by nature. Australian by nature. I am British, British by, by birth. birth. Look, um, so I think there's a there's a lot of merit in what both Nick and Alistair were saying. I, I mean, in the end. You know, some of what Nick's saying I think is correct, which is, in the end, if you like a policy, you consider it democracy, and if you don't like a policy, you often call, call it um, uh, po populism. And in, in the event that those popular policies come forward, I think, and, and it, it's to take some issue with what the questioner put forward, because of a, a, a policy that has been uniformly unpopular, and that is mass immigration. Mm. Yeah. Mass immigration into the States, mass immigration into the UK, and, and increasing immigration into here, I think is one of the big causes of where these popular leaders get their ballast from in order to talk. And you talk about what we can do to stop it. Look, in the end, I think there are, there are you know, there's criticism of both sides. But, you know, in the end, I agree with Nick on some of this, which is the left, in terms of the way it has approached how you form the conversation, has meant it's made it very difficult for us to talk about mass immigration mm, okay. without being considered as racist. Yeah. We have to decouple them, because in the end, if people are un unhappy about mass immigration, as I think they are, and, as you mentioned, the underlying factors, then we have to address it. So for Australia, which I don't think has caught that virus, I think it's a really good time for us to look at what's happened overseas and say, mm. how can we frame the conversation differently here mm. so that the people who are upset feel like they have a voice and we can address that? Absolutely. Totally. Thank you, Kate. I'm going to go to the next question and then bring Jeff in. Um, it's on the same subject or part of the same subject from uh, Thomas Russell. The uh, rise of right-wing populism has provoked, as we've seen, sharp criticism and lurid historical analogies from leftist critics you see in it a dark and disturbing turn for global society. Popular politics used to boost the political left. Are they just mad the right's now beating, with, beating them at their own game? Jeff Gallup. Well, I think what's happening in the world today, there's, there's a counter-enlightenment. Uh, we defeated fascism and, of course, ultimately communism as well in the, the 19, late by 1989 it had collapsed. We looked as though our part of the world was moving towards a better type of society that there'd be freer trade, which would help those in developing countries and also have a better mix of people throughout the world. Uh, we were having great reforms, great reforms, uh, gay and lesbian equality, uh, women's rights, uh, anti-racism was becoming part and parcel of our culture. And what we're seeing at the moment is an enormous reaction against that, represented very much by President Trump. And that reaction cannot lead us to a better place. It cannot lead us to a better place. And I hope that when our Prime Minister meets Donald Trump, he says to him, OK, we're part of uh, the American alliance and we can uh, talk about the issues associated with that. But, President, the things you are saying, the standards you are setting, the agenda you are pursuing is undermining the type of society that, has, that offers people hope. What's the alternative? We've got Xi Jinping arresting and putting into prisons the Uyghur population of China. We've got Putin, who's already acted in a, in a totally unprincipled way in Crimea. He's got troops up around uh, the, the Latvian states, Latvia and the other uh, states up there. And what do we need at this time? Do we need a President Trump talking the foul language, the prejudiced politics, the racism, the sort of implicit fascism that's part of it all? The type of society we believe in doesn't need the populism of Donald Trump. <coughs> Jeff, I'll just take you we back. Need reason and interest. Mm. Jeff, I'll just take you back to um, mm. one of the core parts mm. of the question. It's, it's really about the methods that both the left and the right have used traditionally. And the suggestion from our questioner yep. appears to be that the right is now using those methods, but more successfully. Well, um, now, uh, this goes, I think, to one of the points you've made publicly yep. about social media and how some yep. aspects of it are undermining democracy, in your view? Well, of course, social media, there are no gatekeepers. I mean, one of the, the, the important issues in any contemporary democracy, as it was raised way back in the 19th century by the great uh, liberal socialist, John Stuart Mill. 
and he said there's always the potential for a tyranny of the majority. And we've got to make sure that those minorities that are within the system are properly protected. You can do that through human rights type legislation. Uh, you, you can do it through good government, making sure that people in, in those categories have a chance to have a say. And so I, I think that this idea, this idea that we can have a better society that protects minorities, and later on we'll talk about one group of minorities, those people with serious mental illness in our society, uh, it's important that we check the majority. And, and what we're getting from uh, populism is anything goes, there are no gatekeepers, the media can't control uh, what comes out through the social media. Previously, they were under some obligation to check the facts that they're putting up. Academics uh, don't have the influence that they had in respect of the issues that they can put up based on evidence. The public service is being undermined. Uh, that's one of the big issues of American politics we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Trump is totally undermining mm -hmm. the public service of the US. And, and if you're interested in this, look at what he's done to the wonderful Department of Agriculture. One of the great achievements of the Roosevelt government. Uh, we, uh, very seriously important research and development, providing assistance to uh, rural communities all through America, totally demolished. And, and I think that we've got to stand up against this, and I hope that uh, when Scott Morrison meets the President, he points out what the values of Australians are, and we just really do not need a lead from America going down this path. Alistair Campbell, um, well, you were one of the masters of the dark arts of spin. Uh, so the question to you is... <laughs> Has the right now actually mastered those dark arts better than the left? I remember Bill Clinton used to say the right has always had the best tunes. Mm. You know, they, they, they do the patriotism thing. Uh, they're very... They're, you know, they've always been kind of tough on crime. The, the, the immigration th debate always... You know, the right used that as a, as a political lever. I mean, I, I, I was a tough campaigner, but when, when Tony Blair was Prime Minister... I considered myself, in anything I ever said to a journalist, I considered myself subject to exactly the same uh, parliamentary principles that he was held to every time he stood up in Parliament. Donald Trump, according to the Washington Post, he tells an average of 12 lies a day. That is more than most people wash their hands. Uh, but he says it's fake news. So, of course uh, he says it's uh, fake news. As soon as he news. says that, half the population thinks yes, he's right. Yes, I know, and they think he's right, and that's the problem, because Jeff's right about this, about this issue of enlightenment. One of the worst things in our referendum was Michael Gove, who's meant to be quite a clever Conservative cabinet minister, saying that the world was sick of experts. Well, I, I kind of want experts. If I'm, you know, if I've got cancer, I want a guy who knows how to treat it. If I'm on a plane, I want the pilot to know what he's doing. But we're electing now politicians. I mean, honestly, I know we're going to talk about Boris Johnson. There's never been a less qualified person to be the Prime Minister yeah. of a great country. Don't tell us all about him yet, because we're, okay. we're definitely going to come to him. <laughs> but, Nick Cater, I'll just give you um, the final word on this subject, because I can see you're sort of burning with I do, the I, I find this whole notion that, you know, the spin, that somehow these are demagogues that are working the population... They do like lie. Into straightforward into lies, though. I find that just demeaning to ordinary people. People Why? make up their own minds. Trump are is... they entitled to make up their minds based on fact or invention? Trump is, Trump is not you're popular. you're going to have to uh, let Trump... your, your uh, okay. philosophical Trump... opponent have his day. Trump's <laughs> popularity does not come because he's able to mesmerise people with, fa with, with fake news, spin, whatever. His popularity comes because he connects with something deep in the American population, what they think, what they want. And, and as this question of values that, 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 that Jeff threw up, I mean... There is, there is, we've, it, we, we have at last a President of the United States that is prepared to take on China. Yeah. He, he's taking it on, unfortunately, in the trade realm. We'd rather we didn't see that. But when it comes to values, somebody has to take on China. Somebody has to take on this communist country which has still not reformed its way since 1949. And I find that deeply encouraging. And, and let's not forget what he's doing to the US economy as well. OK, uh, all right, sorry, Kate, go ahead. Well, can I just say to Alistair, you know, I think that, that point about, you know, we no longer need experts and, you know, who, who's the, ex the expertise about our life? For me, the political ructions that have happened, or, you know, in, in the US and the UK actually become because people don't believe what they've been told. People see their lived experience and their lived experience is not good. Yeah, but... yeah, and what they're told is that liberal democracy works and that it delivers. But when you're actually out there looking at your life, going, I have no job, I have no security, Fine, but... I don't, you know... I don't, I don't like the way my village looks like now. It's like you don't want experts because it's like I can see how my life is. Wait, wait a minute though. I don't like but it. Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. They, you say that people don't believe, right? They are being believed 
even though they know that that person's not telling the truth. When Donald Trump goes to Pittsburgh and says we're going to reopen the coal mines, do they really believe that? But no. Alistair, I'm not Boris that... Johnson says we're going to get more money for the health service. Now he says, well, I didn't really mean that. But, I've but got Alistair, a different set of lies for this Alistair, part of my I'm not, career. I'm not saying that they are the but answer. People are believing okay. that. I'm not saying they are the answer. I'm saying Guys, that's the problem. Uh, I'm just going to interrupt both of you because we will come back to the Boris Sorry. Johnson Brexit uh, <laughs> phenomenon uh, shortly. <laughs> In five weeks' time, we'll have Q&A's 2019 high school special when senior students get a chance to join the panel and debate Australia's future with today's politicians. So if you've got what it takes, head to our website and upload your audition video. We want Australia's political leaders to meet the leaders of tomorrow. Well, our next question comes from Sabrina Coe. Sabrina. Hi, good evening. I commend those on the panel today who have spoken out suffering anxiety and depression, the black dog. I myself have suffered from anxiety and depression and I'm still hesitant about speaking openly about it in the workplace. And further, feeling that I come from a privileged position with loving family, loving friends, a job, a home, living in a peaceful country, that I don't have a right to suffer from mental illness. For those who are suffering from mental health issues in silence but still trying to maintain a semblance of normal life, do you think it's responsible to continue to hold the prominent positions you hold at work and carry on? Or would you say it's your responsibility to withdraw from, well, responsibility? Alistair, I'll start with you because yeah. this is why you're in Australia. So um, tell us, well, answer the question, obviously. Well, it, all of that, that is a really personal decision for people. But, for example, if I think about a lot of the things that I've done in my life, working with Tony Blair, uh, you know, helping him to win three elections, achieving lots of change, Northern Ireland peace process, all the things that we did. I actually think that the experience I had in having had a psychotic breakdown in the 80s and in having had chronic bouts of depression on and off for most of my life, I think that has been an advantage to me. I think it gives me resilience. I think it gives me empathy. I think I understand better than most politicians how people feel. And I also think that I've, I, I, I was, <laughs> I say lucky, I had no choice but to be open because when I switched from journalism, where I had my breakdown, into frontline politics, the journalists that used to be my friends started to write about me, including about that. And I took a decision, I'll just be open about it. And I've never, ever regretted that. And it's a personal decision. Only you can decide, but you've decided to be open. I think that's great. I don't think you'll ever regret that. Can you, can you just um, explain one thing? For those who haven't seen the documentary yeah. or don't know a lot about it, I mean, yes, you had a breakdown at a, a time when you were a very senior political correspondent um, and it was a psychotic breakdown mm -hmm. and you were terribly afraid because your brother had schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, how do you actually rebuild from that? I mean, for, for people who, who have faced um, or looked into the abyss, how do you recover from it? Well, it's, I mean, again, it's incredibly personal. Um, in that we're all different. So I, for example, I was incredibly lucky. I had an amazing partner who stood by me when a lot of women would not have done. I had a very supportive doctor. I had a... Um, I had, the most important, in a way, was my former employer, who I'd left to go to a different job, phoned me up and asked me to go back, even though he knew that had happened. And I think the other thing that really, really helped me, the, the luck, I was arrested by two policemen. And I thought about this today, because I was watching your news and you had this riot in the youth detention centre. When I was ill, when I was heading to my breakdown, I could get quite violent, OK? When I was drunk, in particular. And I, I, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and I've imagined that I've headbutted this policeman, the guys who arrested me. And I imagine if I had done that, you're, that's your life gone. You're in the criminal justice system and that's it. You're never going to get to the United States. You're certainly never going to get a job in politics. So I was incredibly lucky. And then I think the thing about recovery, you talk about schizophrenia, my brother. My brother had, my brother had schizophrenia and, OK, his life was not as good as it would have been had he not had schizophrenia, but he had an amazing employer and he had the same job for 27 years. Now, most people think that's impossible. The reason he had that job for 27 years is because his employer didn't define him by his illness. Mm. And nobody should be defined by their illness. He was an employee who had schizophrenia. That meant they had to adapt. But I think some of the cleverest people I've ever met are mentally ill. Some of the nicest people I've ever met are mentally ill. And I think we've just got to get over this idea that we, we all have mental health. 
you know, we use these figures, one in four will be mentally ill at some point in their lives. One in one of us has got mental health, and it's never perfect. I'm going to go to uh, Jeff Gallup, because, yeah. Jeff, you mm. made the decision to yeah. step aside yeah, sure. from a, a, a very important and responsible job, the Premier of Western Australia. I guess that I'd had uh, issues related to uh, anxiety through my whole life, really, and I'd never reflected upon them, but each time they took me over, <laughs> it got a little bit worse and, and I got to a situation where I had to make a decision. I mean, there's no doubt that, in theory, I could have stayed on and, and perhaps had a, a, a <coughs> tried to, to deal with the issue from within the system, but uh, I made a choice that I, I'd, I'd leave and try something different. Now, we, we, we really should have a situation where uh, it's, it's not necessary that we leave our employment, as Alastair is saying, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, mental illness. Do you, do you I think a... politics was a little bit different mm. in, in the nature of what you do, and I was a bit frightened about the prospect of talking about it in the context of, of politics. I'll, I'll admit that, because, uh, you know, the press are looking at you every day, everyone's looking at you, and you, if you slip up... You know, the disappointment for me, I didn't finish the agenda that I sort of had in politics, although I'd been in for 20 years, which is a pretty good run. Uh, and so I decided I'd step back and try and contribute my understanding and knowledge as best I can. And, and, and the one thing that comes through all the time is to talk about these issues with close friends, with family, with your medical practitioners. And if we look at uh, anxiety-related anxiety illnesses and depression, you know, they are very, very... Uh, th there's treatment available, either of the cognitive sort or the medication, that can put you on an even path again. So I, I think that, to me, that's the important thing. One of the problems we do have, of course, is that the interests and needs and character of everyone is different. Mm. And, and, and our service delivery tends to be a bit top-down. And, and it doesn't always capture what's the essence of the issue for, for an individual person. And, and I think our treatments, as good as they are, have got to take into account the needs and interests of those that are taking those treatments. And I think that's an issue. I have a lot of empathy uh, for people, particularly as, as illnesses get more serious and there's a standardised version of, of a response to it that's not dealing with their real needs. And this means, you know, as a society, we've got to, I think, scale up our belief in solidarity, one person to another. You know, we live in a very competitive society. We live in a society that wants economic growth at all costs. This is not good uh, in terms of those of us that have anxiety issues or get under pressure and find it difficult to cope sometimes with those issues. So I think there are general social issues at stake here, policy issues as well as, as the service issues that we... The, the questions related to service delivery. And Tina. Oh, it's, you know, such a prevalent issue, um, mental health. And I think, you know, in the service delivery, as you say, Jeff, um, dealing with uh, the acute crisis end mm. is such a, a dilemma for people. And, of course, you've been talking today, Alistair, to, to a group about this. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, the focus on prevention uh, and resilience that could be built in the early years, we know a lot about this. Schools are becoming the epicentre mm. of, of many of these anxiety disorders. So there's actually a lot we could do on the preventive side in a community context, I think the provision in and around someone whose mental health problems escalate quickly uh, is terribly difficult and people just don't know how to access those services in a time of real crisis. I'm just going to go to another question on the same subject uh, while we can. It's from Chrissy Grant. Chrissy. Oh, hi there. Um, lovely to meet you. Alistair, I love what you said. Well, um, I lost my precious brother to suicide in 2015, shattering and changing our lives forever. We live in the Sutherland Shire of Sydney, uh, down near Cronulla Beach, and um, where there is no to little support um, for the bereaved and for the suicide. The suicide rate continues to rise. I'm fighting with Sutherland Hospital, um, our local MPs, um, and pleading with Scott Morrison to do more. I have taken it on myself with some others to start up a mental health and suicide prevention action group, because if not me, then who? Um, I'm disgusted at the lack of support. Um, I'm disgusted at lack of facilities of all the money going to other agendas except for saving our lives. In Australia, suicide now takes eight lives a day uh, and I just can't sit back and do nothing. Um, I want to see safe houses. I want to see education and life skills. I want to see more done for the youth. 
I want to see kindness, respect, uh, and I want us all to, like you were saying, Alistair, love, res um, support, and just uh, encourage the mentally ill. My brother was a beautiful, kind soul that was lost in the system. My mum was his carer for 20 years uh, until he devastatingly took his life in our family home. Since then, we've had, like, no support. Um, and I'm just sick of, like, mental health being bottom of the barrel. Alistair, uh, again, I'll start with you because yeah. your key subject is politics and mental health. And yeah. Of course, um, I'm not saying the solutions lie with politics, but the decision to call it a crisis does. Well, listen, <coughs> this is what gets me about this, because, that you know, you see not just the, the loss of life, it's the, it's the impact forever mm. and the costs forever. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and when Anne was talking about, you know, if we can help people when they're young... And, I mean, how many of those people who are rioting in that place today, how many of them actually are mentally ill? Yeah. Yeah. How many of them shouldn't maybe be better off in hospital somewhere? And so suicide... I'm a patron of a suicide sanctuary in, in London. And suicide's, suicide's the biggest killer in the UK as well, of young yeah. men. I was okay? in London for 25 years. Right. I just got back to support my mum. Yeah. So, and, and the what's, thing is... What's going on, do you think? You mentioned young men in particular. Yeah. I think you've made the point publicly that uh, young women have an epidemic of self anxiety, anxiety and yeah. self-harm, but yeah. young men yeah. are killing themselves in greater numbers than ever before. I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. And I don't... I think the problem with our generation is I'm not sure we really know what's going on with young people. I think we sort of think, oh, it's social media. I don't think we really know. But I, I'll tell you this. When... Theresa May became Prime Minister in the UK. She said mental health was going to be a priority. When David Cameron came in, he said mental health was going to be a priority. The words are so easy. So Scott Morrison has come in yep. and he said his goal is zero suicide. Mm -hmm. now, that's a very big, bold goal. Yeah. But don't just say it. Action. Have the plan. Yeah, and I haven't seen that yet. Come to my house and I'll tell you a plan. Or come Tony, there's, a, there's, there's an expression that I think is important in this area. Young people at the moment are the miners' canaries of our society. They're picking up the real issues that we have deep down in the way that we conduct our social relationships, the way we organise our society, the priorities we give. They're picking it up. They can't see the hope. And, and I think we have a responsibility in politics, those of us that are in politics, to recognise that factor. And, and to build a better society. Mm. Uh, it, it's not the complete solution, but young people are telling us something mm. and we should be listening. Nick Cater, um, <coughs> it seems... I think it's fair to say that no government of any complexion in Australia has ever focused on mental health issues in the same way they've focused on physical health issues, the billions to build hospitals for GPs, etc. Is it time that at least one government changed that? Well, I mean... It is, slowly. I mean, uh, I remember talking to a minister... Oh, it would be 15 years ago, uh, because I've got experience of mental illness and I know how many other people have relatives or have had mental illness themselves. It's a big issue, huge issue in the community, and Chrissy's <laughs> story is, you know, really heart-wrenching. Um, and, and, and at the time, the minister said, we'd, we'd like to, we're just not sure. You know, they were, there, was, there was some trepidation, it was a stigma and everything's attached. Well, now we've got a position where the, where the, where the, where the Morrison government last year invested $4.8 billion in it. Uh, we can argue it's not enough, but it's the most ever. And included in that, Alistair, you'd be delighted to know, is half a billion towards a national suicide prevention plan, uh, which includes funding people like Beyond Blue and, and, and other organisations. But also they've got uh, a, a, a real-time hotspot program in place so if they can see suicides happening because we know often there's a copycat effect they can act on that so it's happening it's slow in one way I'm glad it's slow because I think we need to learn as we go along mm. and the one area that I'm really really concerned about and I learned this at the weekend I was with a on a charity ride uh, for soldier on uh, and this just shook me to the core and one of the veterans got up and said do you know that we've had 56 mm. of our combatants died in combat since 2001 and 373 suicides. Mm. 56 people die at the hands of the enemy, 375 mm. die at their own hands. Now, there's something very wrong going on there, and I really, really want to see something done mm. for our return service men and women. I'm just going to say, if uh, you or anyone you know is experiencing difficulties, call the number on your screen. The next question <laughs> comes from Timothy Brookman. 
Oh, hi. Um, rates of mental illness, as we've noted, have increased inarguably in recent years and decades. And while the cause of this increase might be varied and complex, I think, I believe it can be attributed to a changing and developing social and cultural landscape. So therefore, is the only solution to mental health reacting to it with medication, with programs and initiatives, or is there a place and a responsibility to address and counteract and combat potential social and or cultural causations? Uh, Alison, I'll start again with you because it is actually the subject of your documentary where you uh, went through, um, really at the urging of your daughter for the mm. most part, um, mm. a whole series of potential treatments. Mm -hmm. um, I would note here that you didn't actually go through with any of them because <laughs> they required you going off medication. In the end, I decided I didn't want to risk coming off the medication. Um, it's too scary? It's just that I've done it before and it's always not ended very well. Uh, and I, look, my, I've got a psychiatrist I see who puts me on the medication he does and he admits it's trial and error. He doesn't know. Mm, yeah. He doesn't know what it's doing to me. So we have to kind of do trial and error. And I've tried lots of different treatments, lots of different forms of medication, on and off and on and off. And I've found one now that I, I, I'm slightly worried it's my new addiction. I've been on it for four years. I, think, I don't think I'll ever come off it. But it's doing me fine. I still get depressed. But I think that, that I'll tell you the really big worry, and it's really interesting what you say about this, the causation and the, and the social and cultural landscape. I think part of the problem, this is the thing I said in the, in the, at the City Recital Hall tonight, I think part of the problem is that we, we think about the health service and we basically mean physical health, we mean hospitals, we mean doctors and all that stuff. We don't have a mental health service, we have a mental crisis service. Mm. And even then, as you found, it can be very, very uh, lacking. So, and it's back to Anne's point, a mental health service says that we, we, we look after children's well-being. And I have to say to Scott Morrison, you know, the New Zealanders might be ahead of him on this because Jessica Arden is putting well-being at the heart of policy. And I think mental health and well-being, it's got to be part of education policy, it's part of, it's part of the criminal justice policy, it's part of sports policy, it's diet, it's nutrition. I mean, the, the, the relationship between physical and mental health is, is that? very close. Totally. We should just really talk about health problems, shouldn't we, really? Exactly. And, 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 you know, as you, as you say in your documentary, things like physical exercise, what you eat, you know, those things are very important to your mental health as well. Sure. So I, I, I feel that we need to get away from this idea that, that really stigmatises that there's something odd about mental health. Mm. It's just, all, as you say, it's about normal... Well -being. But the politicians do have to take a lead. Employers are important, mm. families are important, but the politicians have got to take a lead. And what I'm sick of, every time I do a panel in the UK or around the place with a, with a politician, and they'll all stand up and say, it's so great that we're all talking about this. And I stand up and say, I am sick to death of talking about this. Can we please have services that match the scale of the need? OK, Jeff, I'll go to you and we'll finish and move on to other subjects. After this. Well, well, I think the point's been made about the, uh, the, the, the service delivery. But in answer to the, the question, I think we're, we're, we're complex beings. You know, there's all this biochemistry going on inside us. Some psychiatrists over the years have focused on that. There's early experiences uh, that we've had as individuals and some of us don't even realise how some of those <laughs> things are affecting us. Then there's the type of society that, that we live in. Uh, I, I think the World Health Organisation definition of health back in 1946, I think it was, which says we're, you're dealing with physical illness but also mental wellbeing is, is the best definition that I've ever seen of health. Mm -hmm. and, and if we made that the objective of governments, the objective of governments, interestingly, there'd have to be an economic component in it because, mm -hmm. I mean, health does require uh, uh, jobs. I spent some time in the Netherlands in recent years and lived near a park called Safati Park. And Safati Park was, uh, had a monument to Dr Safati, who was a 19th century public health physician. And he decided, that he, he said, if we're going to create a, a more wellbeing in our community, we need jobs. So he convinced a lot of businessmen to build the Amstel Hotel, which is now one of the leading hotels, because it gave work to people. So I think we need to integrate social, economic, environmental issues in our public policy making. And that will have a spin-off, I think, in terms of general wellbeing. But the service part of mental health really needs a lot of attention. And, and we think we're doing it. We think we're doing it because we've done some good things. 
okay. like Beyond Blue, for example. But we haven't really... We haven't really. OK. Uh, people with serious illness will tell you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, on this program, we are planning to come back uh, to a full program on the subject. So you're watching Q&A live. Remember, if you do need help, it's just a phone call away. The number is on your screen. Now, our next question comes from Quentin Fiducian. Ah, thank you. Um, my questions. Is Brexit the last gasp of not only the British Empire, but of British political power and influence in the world affairs? If Britain exits, how long can it main, uh, maintain a position in the Security Council? And how long will the city, the financial centre of London, actually continue to exist, some of it having already uh, emigrated to Paris? Nick Cater, we'll start with you. Uh, I, Britain was a member of the Security Council, of course, since the creation <laughs> of the UN. So I don't... I didn't join the, the EU until <laughs> 73. So I don't quite see how those two things relate. No, I think it's quite the opposite. I think this is, this is the rebirth of Great Britain. It's a chance for you to get... Start looking <laughs> outwards again. Outwards again, instead of inwards. Now, I understand... It was very controversial at the time, as you know, back in 73. I understand why people looked at Europe which by then, at that stage, you know, had been growing rapidly, 4.8% annual GDP growth for the previous 10 years. People said that's where the action is. Britain was going backwards. And, you know, Australia, New Zealand, we just had to manage. Well, we did. Um, but then, you know, fast forward to the present, and, and you're, you're in a Europe which is looking increasingly irrelevant to the rest of the world. You know, 1% GDP growth on average in the last 10 years. Well, why don't you go back to your old Commonwealth mates? You know, 20, the top 24 countries in the Commonwealth have grown by nearly 5%. Mm -hmm. That's where the action is. India's overtaken Britain now, which I think is a good thing. It shows what good colonies you established. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's an indication of how the world's changed, Alistair. And, and if you're just going to sit around wondering about w what order to button your jacket in in order to talk to the EU, you know, forget well, it. That's well, when Britain... To, to go back to our question, and that is when Britain <laughs> has given up the ghost, when it has to, you know, latch itself on to France, Germany, Nick, Nick while, you're not, while you're on a roll, I've got to ask you about Boris Johnson, because <laughs> he uses a similar kind of faux Churchillian language um, in his kind of Brexit, yeah. uh, encouraging the country to move to Brexit. And I'm just wondering whether he's actually going to take Britain back to some glorious past, in your idea. Oh, look, I don't think so. I mean, you describe me what does a Brexit... Uh, 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 a Boris, Boris lover. Bro Bro uh, well, Boris lover. Look, Boris liked my book, so I was like him. But, I mean, the, the point about Boris is he's not... He's a far from a perfect politician, you pointed out. He's a lot of fun. We love him. I mean, if you bring him out to an audience in Australia, you know, you get a packed house. He's great. But, but he does... We least... certainly have him on this program. Yeah, he exactly. Does arrive in the country. He doesn't do difficult questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he dodges them very nicely, though. But I, I, I think the thing is, we've, we've had, you know, possibly the worst Prime Minister, certainly the worst Prime Minister the Tories had ever, ever produced in Theresa May, completely unup to the, uh, not up to the task of steering mm. through this important reform. Well, I think that's something you and um, Alistair agree on. Uh, I'm um, sure. But let, let's throw but, but, let's but throw on, back on to the general point. On okay, Boris, just, just, just to say, I think at least in Boris, at least in his rhetoric, and I hope in his actions too, you've seen somebody who says we're going to have the toughness to go for the tough Brexit, which is what it's going to take. Um, Alistair, I'll come to you and I'll come to Anne after that because I want to hear the Australian perspective on this. Uh, I, was, I think it answers the gentleman's question. My, my mother died a while ago and when I was going through her clearing out the house, I came across all my old school reports and there was one when I was about 14, it was history, and it said, Alistair's essay on the decline of the Austro-Hungarian Empire <laughs> was a very good piece of work. And I thought... I just wonder if in a few decades <laughs> our children and grandchildren will be writing to what extent was the referendum of 2016, the end of the United Kingdom, as you say, is a serious power. I'll give you a couple of examples. None of us know what's going to happen in the future, but Boris Johnson, who lied to win the referendum, is now lying about the consequences of a no-deal Brexit, which will be severe for both the British and the Irish and the European economy. Worse for us than Ireland and then the rest of the European Union. And when I see him say that this, the cost of this can be vanishingly inexpensive, and I think, the guy's not thought it through. And in his head... I mean, I've known Boris Johnson for a long time, when we were journalists, then he used to come to my mm. briefings, and... Did he like your book, too? He loved my book. <laughs> but inside his head, <laughs> he is Winston Churchill, and in reality... He's a hack. 
<laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a funny, as you say, he's a funny hack. And as Jeff said earlier, with China, with Russia, with India becoming much more powerful, I think the idea of Britain recreating some kind of, you know, glorious past when these really yeah. big global powers are coming. And listen, even the Australians, certainly the Japanese, are they going to are they going to be more interested in trade with this massive Hugely. trade? Hugely, we're ready to sign up a believe. trade deal with. Well, them hang on a second. Hold on. On. We, we have six. I'm going to pause 60. you both just for a second because we've actually got a question relatively on this subject from Max Greve. We might as well go to it. Thanks, Hi, Max. Penny. It seems inevitable that Boris Johnson will be the next Prime Minister of I'm the UK. I'm sadly that's true. <laughs> what does his rise mean to Australia and Australian politics? And Tina, I'll start with you. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, well, I think there's a number of constitutional questions that I'm very interested to see how they're going to play out. Um, we've had a very interesting um, uh, series of events over the weekend where a number of the Tory um, ministers still serving under Theresa May, and I think mm. we should come back to the Theresa May question because I just wonder whether she was dealt a very fair hand by the boys who walked away and left mm. her with the big mess. But anyway, um, putting that to one side, um, I think that, uh, you know, he has to contend with a number of very significant issues before he can get he can get there. Um, you know, we may see some cabinet ministers go. Um, he's still got to get it through the parliament, which Theresa May hasn't well, been able to. It could be uh, what so they call it, in Britain a confidence motion against uh, absolutely. the government. They we, could be we call at it the a no-confidence motion. Absolutely. Yeah. They could be at the polls in no time flat. The so there's actually a long way to go before we can think about what the implications are for um, Australia. I think the implications for Northern Ireland are, are pretty significant. Uh, and I think the uncertainty is the, the extraordinary challenge. Uh, and the economic uncertainty is just very debilitating for investment and confidence and, and all those sorts of things. So I think I, I see that um, he's given an interview, um, Johnson, where he sort of says that people are being, um, you know, it's like a moon landing. People have to think about it uh, with the ambition of a moon landing and you can solve all these technical problems. This guy couldn't even but, build a garden brick. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, go to the moon. Be that as it may, Alistair, but the point is that, you know, 31 October is looming mm -hmm. uh, and something has to happen and whether yeah. he can get it through the parliament. I mean, Australia is sort of a, a way off what's going to happen, um, but there's huge uncertainty uh, and, and I think the constitutional questions are actually in some ways the most interesting, <laughs> but you'd expect me to say that. Yeah, well, say, yeah, go ahead. So the lesson for Australia to me is very simple. When you're asking an important question, make sure you ask the right question. Mm -hmm. The problems that come from the Britain at the moment is that in the end they went out and they asked a binary question yeah. where people could give... They, you didn't say it has to be a majority of 60 or it has to be a majority of 70, which essentially they, they set it up, I think, incorrectly to get the result that they have ended up with. Mm. So when we as a nation or any nation is looking at making a really important decision, you have to really think it through. And I think in the end, that failure sits with David Cameron as much Absolutely. as it sits with anyone else. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff Gallup, um, as the implications for Australia. I mean, uh, uh, Nick Cater is talking about a grand new alliance of trade, etc. Do you think that could happen? Well, I would hope that the Australian government, in, in, in looking into these sorts of issues, puts Australia's interests first, you know, in, in terms of any trade deals. I mean, Europe is a massive economy, uh, and, and, and any, any notion that we would privilege Great Britain for these sort of fantasy imperial reasons, yeah. uh, when there's a, there's a massive market there that we, we need to be part of, I'd be very concerned. I'm, I'm not sure that would happen, and I'm sure that the public service will be providing good advice to the government, but there are some on the conservative side of politics that have a, a completely delusionary view about where Britain fits in, in the global economy and, and how just a few trade connections between us and them will somehow deliver great benefits to us as opposed to uh, the European Union. But uh, can I just make one comment as well? That I, I disagree, I think, with what was said earlier about Theresa May. I mean, she's not of my politics, but I thought she handled herself with tremendous dignity as Prime Minister of Britain. She was being undermined every day, undermined every day, uh, that she went to the dispatch box, uh, and uh, she, she, I think, displayed great grace in the way that she carried out her function. So I'm... I'm against her politics and I think she couldn't get it together and there are a lot of criticisms. Mm. But I, I think Nick really... I don't think it's appropriate to say that she's the worst leader that the, Look, the Tories she, she ever may, had. She may have been... She mm. may have been... I mean, she was mm. amazing the way she'd get up every yeah, yeah. day like nothing had happened. But I think that's is, what, did she, what did she achieve? <laughs> what did she achieve? Did she achieve what the British people had overwhelmingly... OK, that, 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 that point's, that point's no. been made. Alistair, um, we could be heading for an election if 
there is a constitutional crisis, if there's a no confidence vote, we would call it in um, a government heading for a mm. no deal Brexit. What happens in that election? Um, you've already been expelled from the Labor Party for voting for the uh, Lib Dems, actually, because Protesting against they Labor's wanted Brexit a policy. second referendum. But Labor will not go down that path. Well, they, the they, they, listen, they're moving in that direction. And I, I, see, I think there's only three, three routes out now. There's crashing out without a deal, which I think would be catastrophic, and I don't think Parliament will let that happen. And by the way, this point about Cabinet Ministers leaving, if Theresa May really, really wanted to screw Boris Johnson, she could actually go to the Queen and say, I don't think there's anybody there who can command a majority. Because there's, there's these MPs... Because it looks a bit like that. They're going to rebel. So, so you might have to go for an election. But the point about an election, in, an, in our politics normally, you, if you've got a government that the country thinks is failing, there's an opposition there that think, right, we'll go for those guys. At the moment, they think the government's failing and they think the opposition's failing. So nobody's going to get power. So what you could end up... And here's where you do see the break-up of the United Kingdom. You could end up with a situation where the only way to form a government is to have the SNP... Yeah, we'll come in, but we need a referendum on Scotland. Mm. And they'll win it at this time, I think. Mm. And the Lib Dems say, you yeah, will come in, but we want another referendum. And I think the only way this is going to get resolved is to go back to the people. Johnson has to win a separate mandate. He doesn't have a mandate for no deal. Mm. To put it back to the people, and I honestly believe if there was another referendum, the country would say, we've wasted three years of our life on this nonsense, let's just put it behind us and move on and start to address the real problems facing the country. OK, well, we're going to put this subject behind us and move on. Remember, if you hear any doubtful <laughs> claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC fact-check. I didn't check. swear about Johnson, that's good. And the Conversation <laughs> website for the results. The next question comes via Skype. It's from Jenny Grounds in Riddles Creek, Victoria. Jenny. Thanks, Tony. The invasion of Iraq by the US, supported by Australia and Britain, has contributed to a lot of mental and physical health problems in Iraqi people and Iraq war veterans alike, apart from tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths. Could Alistair Campbell tell us whether he acknowledges this and whether the lies he told to manipulate Tony Blair's Britain to go to war have contributed to his own depression, perhaps, since then? Well, Alistair, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I mean, look, I can, we can go over the whole thing if you want to. I think there have been six inquiries now into the, 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 the Iraq war, and in every single one of them, I have been cleared of any lying. OK, so let's just part that. You can say it, you can... We're not going to agree, so let her back if you want, but we're not going to agree. Do I recognise and acknowledge two things? One, that the Iraq war did not work out as planned, and have there been the consequences that you talk about? Yes, of course I do. And I talked to my, about my, my brother earlier. He was, he was in the, the armed forces. And I know people in the armed forces. And I know people who've been hugely affected, families as well, by the, 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 the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But all I'd say to you that the difference between people like this audience and people like you, with all due respect, and... Prime Ministers like Tony Blair at the time and John Howard at the time, they have to make sometimes really, really difficult, unpopular decisions. And they make them... And what I, what I will always accept, as I accept it from people like Robin Cook when he was the Foreign Secretary and Jacques Chirac, the French President, I totally accepted that people could see a different way and they didn't want to go that route. But what I will never accept are the conspiracy theories, we did it for oil, we did it for George Bush, or the idea that we, there was some kind of venality. Why would Tony Blair want to have a war that led to British soldiers losing their lives? Why would he want to do that? Mm. Alistair, can I just bring you back to um, the last part of that question? And one of the reasons we allowed that question to go through is because you wrote in your diary um, that your wife, Fiona Miller, thought that one cause uh, of at least one major episode of your depression was that you secretly agreed with her that the Iraq war was a bad mistake. Oh, God, did I put that in my diary? You did. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's... I mean, this is the other thing. Jeff knows this from his time in, in government. These really big decisions... You know, it's back to the way that politics is portrayed. Every, they, the, people have to portray themselves as 100%. It was always a difficult decision. Mm. 
But I wasn't the decision maker. Tony Blair and the cabinet were the decision makers. Well, this so I the, can, can I say, I'll bring you to just another little bit of your diary because after a discussion, you write about this after a discussion about the war among Blair's inner circle, um, you said, I just about convinced myself because it was my job to support it. And then Blair's political secretary, and you write this yourself, so it's, you're the source, um, <laughs> commented, ah, the Nuremberg excuse. Bloody hell, these diaries, they keep coming back to me. Um, look, uh, the, the thing about, you see, because the thing about, and Jeff knows about this as well, is in politics, when the political and the personal mix, that's when it can get very, very difficult. Fiona, my partner, was totally opposed to the Iraq war. Mm. So I would be at work all day arguing for the government position, supporting Tony Blair, and then having the press at me the whole time, going home and having the same thing. <laughs> and what, what I'll accept is that sometimes... I remember Jamie Rubin, who was Madeleine Albright's uh, spokesman. Remember he said when I left Number 10, he said, what you'll find is it will take you a long time to find out what you really think again. Mm. Because you do put yourself... My, that was my job. I still support what Tony Blair did, but I recognise why other people are still so angry about it. Mm. And it's nuanced, it's not black and white. Well, I think we'll move on because we've got time for just one last question. It's from Rosemary King. Rosemary. Hi. Another one for Alistair. Um, if... And the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> if Bill Shorten had asked you to be his campaign manager <laughs> just in time for our May general election, assuming you couldn't change any of the policies, but the messaging to the Australian voting public was totally up to you, how would you have spun a Labor victory? <laughs> would, would you have framed it, uh, framed the policies as reducing inequality, increasing prosperity for all, or just kept your mouth shut and simply attacked the government? <laughs> OK. Which um, is a dilemma that Labor faces now. I know it so does. And, and of, I've been talking to some of the Labor politicians while I've been here, and I think... Countries like this, look, this is a bright... You, there's a lot of bright people in this country. And I think a country like Australia is actually ready for a politics. I know your three-year term... I said this the last time I was on the programme. I think your three-year term is a real problem. But I actually think that you've, there's got to be a sense of a real long-term vision for the country. And I think that's what didn't come over. It felt very tactical. Both sides. And the government... They had a lot of support for the media, in the media. They had these 60 million... I mean, that's a lot of money. A lot of that guy Palmer putting up his money up. That's, that's bad. It wasn't for the government, though. It was for himself. Yes, I know, but it, but it, it was affecting oh, Shorten. Oh, I don't know about that. No, it did. So, and I, and I think... It's actually showing, Nick. I think that the thing, the thing about Labour... I think, look, left of centre, progressive parties around the world are finding this, that they've... We've got to... We still... I talked about Bill Clinton saying the right have the best tunes. We're still singing the old songs. Mm. It's tax and spend. It's more money for this. Jeff's right. When he, Jeff, I read this brilliant speech that Jeff wrote, uh, made recently about education. It was a different way of thinking about education. We've got to... The, the, the world's moving on so fast. These young people that... You know, how, the, the, then they don't think like we think in politics. They, they, so there's got to be that sense, I think, of a big future vision. And I, I also think, and I don't mean this in a personal way about Bill Shorten at all, but I, I felt every time... It was time, unelectable. No, I felt every time I came here, I felt, and I'm afraid it's a little bit I feel this about Jeremy Corbyn in the UK now, I felt the country had decided mm. a long way out yeah. we're not going to elect him. Yeah. I just felt that. Mm. <laughs> Nick Cater. So I wouldn't have taken the oh, job. Sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's amazing oh, how Bill, much I agree, <laughs> agree with you tonight. And, 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 um, and you just reminded me why I thought that Tony Blair was such a promising... Prime Minister, because he thought about education in that different way, in that long-term way. Yeah. But I'm afraid, you look at the Labour Party here, and they've been all about just throwing money about it in education. Sure, we want education to be properly funded, but we really have to have a long-term strategy. We have to get back... Look, in business these days, CEOs are just focused on the next quarter, on getting the profits yeah. up. Yeah. Unfortunately, our politics has become like that. Yeah. So I share your, your view, but I must say, with respect to the, the, the questioner, I think it would have been beyond even your powers to rescue Bill Shorten. <laughs> and what do you think? 
Well, of course, there was a lot of focus on Queensland um, and the extent to which... Some people you call know, it Australia's Brexit. Mate. Well, we wrote a piece about the Quexit, the hashtag Quexit. I, if I've been advising um, Bill Shorten. He spent a lot of time in Queensland, but I don't know... You know, everywhere that was rural and regional voted the same way. It wasn't just Queensland. Um, mm. the, the lady's question who asked earlier the question talked about respect. And I think respect is really what's missing in our politics. And I think many of the people in left-behind places felt they weren't being heard and felt they were being told what to do by people who had no understanding of their life experience. Uh, and I think that's the big challenge for, uh, for Labor, for the political parties, is to actually uh, show some respect to people's lived experience, Kate, you mentioned it before, and find ways of moving beyond the binaries, of moving beyond the potential for disruptors like Palmer, who actually had a massive impact uh, in the marginal seats, um, but got what he wanted, the Galilee Basin. Um, so, you know, there were lots and lots of issues that were constructed that way. The reality was more complex um, and we need to deal with that complexity and we need to be prepared to be respectful of people having a different view and of actually being able to look at house prices in Gladstone or the prospects for their children in Mackay and say, this is, I can't see the transition, I can't see the transition coming for me. Uh, and I think that's what's happened, you know, in the UK and, uh, and other places. So, you know, I would have encouraged, and of course we've had plenty of former Blairites here um, helping really? Labor in the past, not much. Um, so uh, I think they need to think about uh, connecting authentically because actually they've been successful, you know, it's not true that Queensland votes against Labor because they've had Labor state governments, but I think they were concerned about the extent to which um, people's, um, you know, legitimate concerns about transition were being heard and understood. And I just think that wasn't being picked up. Kate. Um, I think that Labor, and I, and I think that Labor here, Labor in the UK, and also the D Democrats in, in the US, all have a similar problem, which is that their classic old narrative was around class and economics. It was around the working class. And that story has moved on effectively. And Labor hasn't crafted a new story. And instead, Labor, and particularly the Democrats, I might say, the progressives, have, have gone down a very specific, narrow um, identity <coughs> politics type, types policies. So I'd say the thing for me with Labor, that, you know, in trying to be quite specific and focused, I think it ended up being quite narrow and divisive. And I think wherever you go down really hard around quite a specific policy that affects a minority, you're always going to get a very strong vocal comeback against it. And I think it just failed completely to come up with that overarching narrative that, you know, enough of the country could get behind. Mm. Jeff, uh, I, I totally, last word to you. I, I totally disagree with Kate. I mean, the class war was conducted by the Conservatives. The people versus the elites. They were running the class war. Mm -hmm. The Labor Party position was, let's look at the middle class uh, and, and some of the, the views that they've had about how to improve our society, and let's link that up with working class people who've had certain issues come up in relation to their material living standards, their opportunities to get education, and to link those two together uh, to create a better society. It was the Liberal and National Party that ran the class war, and they won. And, of course, that means Labor's got to do a lot more thinking about how to forge this alliance, which we need in our modern society, uh, to create change uh, between those of low incomes or perhaps even those that are really battling with life and, and circumstances, with those that are well off but can see that we need to do something about climate, etc. They need to think that through. But, honestly, Kate, if you look at the rhetoric, it's, it, the Liberal Nationals were running the class war uh, and they won. And it's a class war that's rather reflective of the sort of war we're see going to see in, in, with, with Boris Johnson and we're seeing with Donald Trump and we're seeing with some of those uh, European governments. The people versus the experts and the elites. That's the way they're framing the politics. That's class politics. Labor was trying to unite the nation around a fairer go for everyone. But, Jeff, that's mm. true. But in the end, they still didn't craft that narrative that people could listen to. OK, well, I'm sorry, guys. We'll that's true. That. We're going to have to <laughs> leave it. I'm sorry. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our outstanding panel. Anne Tiernan, Nick Cater, Alistair Campbell, Kate Mills and Jeff Keller. Thank you very much. Now, you can continue the discussion on Facebook and Twitter next week. I'm taking a break and RN Breakfast host Fran Kelly will be sliding into the Q&A chair alongside Conservative Liberal stalwart Eric Abetz, Labor Senator Kimberly Kitching, celebrity chef and author Adam Lior, uh, anti-poverty and social justice campaigner Tim Costello and business and communications consultant Parnell Palm McGuinness. Until then, good night.